Hello, and welcome to Six Degrees of Wiki, a podcast by Something Cheeky, where two sisters find the six degrees of separation between Wikipedia articles that don't seem to have anything in common. I'm Rosanna. And I'm Nikki. Today we'll fall into a Wikipedia spiral where Rosanna has just six rounds to figure out how the first article could possibly be connected to the last, while learning all sorts of peculiar facts along the way. Let's get started. Last month, we went from Wonder Woman to the Grimm Brothers. Since it's a new month, we're starting a new topic. Round one. Today, we're spiraling from Mae West to Trojan Horse. Mae West was an American actress, singer, and screenwriter. Also a sex symbol. Her career spanned seven decades. (gasps) And she was quite controversial and had a lot of fights with censorship. Trojan Horse is a very large horse that was built during the Trojan (laughs) War that the Greeks supposedly used to get inside the city gates of Troy. They had men hidden inside, and it enabled them to take over Troy and win the Trojan War that had been going on for a very long time. Rosanna, do you see anything that these two items have in common? Uh, Mostly no, (laughs) except, (laughs) of course, I'm thinking Mae West, sex symbol, Helen of Troy, beautiful, you know, we start a war about Ah, her. So, so far, that's the only thing that seems similar between those two topics. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, you're wrong. So, (laughs) just so you know right off the bat. (laughs) Great. (laughs) So, let's start with some information about our first degree, which is Mae West. She was born in 1893, died in 1980, just about a year before I was born. Maybe I'm Mae West reincarnated. I feel like that's probably true. I feel like it is, too. So she was very famous for lighthearted, double entendres, breezy sexual independence. She was very, very controversial, though, because censorship in plays and films started really ramping up. One reason she was so popular is because she just completely bucked the system. She made comedy out of conventional moors, very moralistic society that was going on right then. And it was the Depression era, and the audience loved her for this because their lives are pretty tough. So it was nice to get out of it. She started performing when she was five in front of a church social, and then just started branching out from there until she was doing vaudeville, and she performed on stage in New York City. And then she moved to Hollywood and became a comedian, an actress and a writer in the motion picture industry, which was pretty uncommon for women. She wrote a ton of her own screenplays. And when she didn't, she often really changed the dialogue for her character. She was also in radio and television. She almost got banned from the radio at one point. (laughs) The American Film Institute named her 15th among the greatest female stars of classic American cinema. Wow. (laughs) <laughs> there was a really great line about her parents is that her parents married, quote, to the pleasure of the groom's parents and the displeasure of the bride's parents, <laughs> end quote. <laughs> and her parents sound like TV show characters. So her dad was a prize fighter that they called Battle and Jack West. Ooh. Then later, when he retired from that, he became a special policeman and then had his own private investigation agency. That sounds like... A Marvel backstory. And her mom was a former corset and fashion model. So we see where she got, I guess, the fight and spirit and her looks. She was also an early supporter of the women's lib movement and gay rights, which in the 20s, unheard of for gay rights. She started on Broadway, but she didn't go to film until she was 40, which is really late for a woman. Especially then, yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. So she had a ton of problems with the censors. At one point, she was asked how she felt about censorship, and she said, I believe in censorship. I made a fortune out of it. (laughs) (laughs) She actually did a lot of fighting against censorship, but she was very funny. She was the highest paid woman in the country and the second highest paid person in the U.S. behind William Hurst. Wow. She made more than the precedent. As we said, religious leaders really condemned a lot of the work that she did, um, called her a negative role model. And in the 50s, after she stopped making movies, for the most part, 
because of all the heavy censorship she was tired of dealing with, she moved to Las Vegas and did a stage show that like broke records for the amount of money it made. <laughs> so she sang on stage while surrounded by a stage full of bodybuilders. Nice. <laughs> She was doing so well, she had her pick of roles. She turned These are roles she turned down, playing opposite Marlon Brando and Elvis Presley. Wow. She turned down two movies by Fellini, and she even turned down a role in Gone with the Wind. She turned it down because they wouldn't let her change everything, all the lines she wanted. Here are my most interesting facts about Mae West. In 1959, CBS censored an interview she did uh, on a show called Person to Person, CBS executives uh, felt that the television audience was not ready to see the nude marble statue of her that was on her piano. <laughs> so they cut the entire interview. Another awesome thing that showed what a wonderful person she was, and also how rich she was. After she was done doing movies, she dated one guy, a boxing champion named uh, William Jones or Gorilla Jones. The management at her apartment building barred him from entering because he was black. So she <sighs> bought the building and lifted the ban. <laughs> <laughs> I love this woman. She's amazing. That's very <laughs> Bruce Wayne of her. Round two. Okay, Rosanna. Yes. You've learned all about Mae West. What do you think the next degree is between Mae West and Trojan Horse? I have no idea. <laughs> um... <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot in there, so there's a lot to work with. None of the words that you said made me go, hmm. Uh, so a couple of words that stuck out were censorship, vaudeville, gone with the wind, <laughs> double entendre, Elvis. Uh, um, I will tell you this, Rosanna. I considered most of those that you just said. <laughs> oh, and wonderful. I followed the path to see. So I think let's go with censorship. Censorship is incorrect. But you did come up with it. The next degree is vaudeville. Oh, that was number two on my guess. Uh, okay, well, maybe that means I'll do better next time. That's not what that means. That never means that. Well, let's learn about vaudeville. It is a theatrical genre of variety entertainment. Is the technical definition. It was basically a variety show. It was really popular in the U.S. and Canada from the early 1880s until the 1930s when they lost their audience to movies. So it was basically a show with a bill of incredibly varied acts. Here are some examples of the acts that a vaudevillian show may have had. Classical music, popular music, comedians, trained animals, female and male impersonators, acrobats, and sometimes pieces of movies in the later years. Wow. Yeah, a whole bunch of stuff. And there's even more. They even had some Wild West show stuff in some of them. So originally they were just kind of shows put on that eventually turned into entire touring companies. And if you went to a vaudeville show today, you would be very offended by a lot that was in it. I'm gonna just going to start with racism. I, I feel like there's a lot of racist content. Oh, so much, so much racism. Blackface, right? Oh, yeah. And not just that. So many people were immigrating to the U.S. at that time. They made fun of not just African culture, but stereotypes about Irish people, Chinese, Italians, Germans, Jews. It was bad. Uh, around the 1910s, they really started to decline because of movies. And so vaudeville performers like Mae West and Fanny Price and the Marx Brothers moved into movies. A lot of the vaudeville theaters were turned into movie theaters themselves, movie cinemas. There were some polite versions of these shows <laughs> where you weren't allowed to say things like hell and stuff like that. My most interesting fact about vaudeville shows is in one particular touring company by Tony Pastor, he had signs backstage that said, don't say slob or son of a gun or holy gee on the stage unless you want to be canceled. Round three. Rosanna, are you ready to guess the next degree between vaudeville and Trojan horse? I'm ready. <gasps> what is it? I have no idea, but I'm ready. You listed so many things that I would like to hear about. <laughs> I know. 
Yeah, I mean, there was so much good stuff. Names, the kinds of shows they had. I mean, there was tons of good stuff. So, all right, hear me out. (laughs) This is going to be good. Okay. Okay. The Trojan horse was not what it appeared to be, right? Okay. So my guess for the next degree is male-female impersonators. (laughs) (laughs) right uh you are (laughs) incorrect (laughs) so incorrect oh darn it may west was a male impersonator in her early vaudeville career she's the Mm -hmm. best she's like my new idol she was the best so what is it then the next degree is acrobats oh that wasn't even on my list of things to guess (laughs) (laughs) So this article wasn't very long, and it's one of those Wikipedia articles that needs additional citations Ah, for verification. Yes. So everything I say about acrobats, listeners, take with a grain of salt. So I tried to keep this to things that seemed like they'd be true. So (laughs) just based on your vast experience (laughs) in acrobatics. (laughs) Acrobats. Perform extraordinary human feats of balance and agility and motor coordination. Basically, they jump around and fly through the air a lot. Elements of acrobatics can actually be found in lots of different performing arts and sports. So here's the alleged history of acrobatics. There was uh, Minoan art from around 2000 BC that has pictures of acrobatic feats on the backs of bulls. Oh. Sounds pretty cool. Huh. Ancient Greeks and Romans practiced acrobatics. Citation needed. (laughs) It's too late to find out if it's true. (laughs) Nobody really knows. All right. (laughs) There were supposedly some displays for the noble court, nobility court, in the European Middle Ages, and they often included juggling. Hmm, Maybe. In China... There have been lots of acrobatics going on since the Western Han Dynasty in 206 BC. They also had acrobatics as part of village harvest festivals. And surprisingly, it wasn't until the late 19th century that they added acrobatics and gymnastics and tumbling as a competitive sport in Europe. Oh. I would have thought it would have been way earlier. Yeah, I would have thought that too. Round four. Rosanna. Yes. What's the next degree? Uh, is it agility? You are correct. <gasps> no. Yes, it's balance or agility. Nice work. <laughs> Thank you. Balance or agility is the ability to maintain the line of gravity, your center of mass within a base of support with minimal sway in your posture. So you have to have a little bit of sway. The article was all about the word sway. (laughs) It was probably in there 50 times. So you've got to have at least a little bit of sway to stand what seems like still, just because of everything moving, you know, the world around you. And even wind will make you move a little bit. Um, By breathing, shifting body weight from one foot to the other, uh, external triggers like floor movement, I mean, even visual distortions rely on sway to keep you balanced. You need balance for things like walking, athletics like acrobatics or martial arts, and standing still. Balance seems pretty simple on the surface, right? Like, you just stand there. Right. It's actually incredibly complicated. So, it uses three sensory systems in your body to maintain balance. The vestibular system, the somatosensory system, and visual systems. So here are all the things your body has to do just to stand there and not fall over. It has to regulate equilibrium, uh, get directional information based on your head position, where you're facing, has to get information from your joints and your skin. It has to keep track of its spatial position and movement, not just in general, but relative to the support surface that you're standing on. It has to use the movement position of all your different body parts and their relation to one another. Also, how vertical you are based on your body and head motion, your location spatially, 
in reference to other objects around. It has to detect changes in the orientation of your body based on your support base. And also if that support base is moving. So all that just to stand up. Just to stand up and not do anything else while you're standing there. Just not fall. Yeah. I thought I was clumsy, but I feel pretty good about myself for being able to stand up straight for a while. I fall down less than one time a day, so I'm doing well. (laughs) So the article had a whole bunch of boring stuff about measuring balance, and I'm going to skip that. You're welcome. (laughs) The coolest fact in this article was, so there are a lot of assessment tools you can use to measure balance. One is called the NeuroCalm. And the tool is $250,000. Whoa. But they have learned that things like the Wii, the Nintendo Wii balance board have also been shown to give accurate results for $25 instead of $250,000. That's exactly what I thought of when you said tools to measure balance. I was like, oh, a balance yeah. board. I used to have one of those. So you could save a lot of money. Yeah. Round five. Are you ready, Rosanna? We're getting close to the end. Yeah. What is the next degree between balance and Trojan horse? That was a weird article. Okay, so I'm going (laughs) to... I mean, anything I come up with is just going to be bananas. Uh, I'm going to try visual distortion. Oh, okay. You are incorrect. The next degree... Is martial arts. Oh, seriously. Okay, I'm I'm really confused now. <laughs> okay, here we go. Martial arts. Uh, lots of systems and traditions of combat practices. They're practiced for lots of different reasons, not just self-defense, um, fighting, but also military and law enforcement, mental and spiritual development, also entertainment and preservation of cultural heritage for different nations. Huh. Mostly people associate it with fighting arts of Eastern Asia. The term martial arts itself, even though East Asia has had these fighting styles for longer, the term martial arts originally referred to the combat systems in Europe as early as the 1550s. The phrase martial arts is derived from Latin, meaning uh, arts of Mars, and Mars is the god of war in Roman mythology. Of course. It makes so much sense when you say it. I never thought about it. Um, It's got Mars in it. Right. So the oldest works of art that have scenes of battle, considered martial arts, are cave paintings from eastern Spain from about 10,000 or 6,000 BCE. Wow. That's a big range. And it showed organized groups fighting with bows and arrows. Uh, Chinese martial arts, which we're probably most familiar with in the Western world, They originated during the Zia dynasty over 4,000 years ago. So alternately in Europe, the earliest martial arts traditions are from ancient Greece. They had a lot of them in the ancient Olympic games, boxing, wrestling. But the gladiatorial combat was included in the martial arts phrase. So you've probably heard of Bruce Lee. Yes. He's credited as one of the first instructors to openly teach Chinese martial arts to Westerners. Mm. And his legacy continued with people like Jean-Claude Van Damme, Chuck Norris, Jackie Chan, and Jet Li. My favorite fact about martial arts. So a lot of the different martial arts that originated in southern India were banned by the British. What a surprise. (laughs) But some of them survived because... The Indians told the British government that they were really just a form of dance, which kind of they are-ish. They look dancey-like sometimes. But that's the only reason that they still have some of them around today and they weren't completely wiped out. Round six. We're almost there, Zanna. This is your last degree between martial arts and Trojan horse. What is it? I feel like I should know what it is. <laughs> However, <laughs> I do not. I'm trying to think of an article that Trojan Horse would be in the beginning of. Mm, okay. And it's not coming to me. Uh, okay. My guess is 
self-defense? <laughs> Are you sure? That was a question mark on the end of that sentence. <laughs> it was definitely a question. <laughs> the answer to your question is no, it was not. You are incorrect. The next degree is Roman mythology. <sighs> of course it is. <laughs> <laughs> Yep, it's because of Mars. So Roman mythology is just a body of traditional stories that are about ancient Rome's legendary origins and religious systems. The Roman myths are often political or moral. A lot of them have to do with how the Roman government worked in accordance with divine law and how people adhered to moral expectations or failed to. There's a lot of a lot of punishment in Roman mythology. Mm. Often for things that are not people's fault. It's unfortunate. Like if you're related to the wrong person, you're in trouble. I mean that that could be true nowadays too. That's fair. I'll give you that. Thanks. One really interesting thing about the Romans is they usually treated all these what we call myths as historical. Ah. Even if they had a lot of miraculous or supernatural elements to them. And the Trojan horse is arguably the most famous bit of Roman mythology. So we don't know if it actually happened or not. And as we've talked about before, the Romans borrowed a lot of religious stuff from other cultures that they took over. Mm -hmm. A lot of Roman mythology is based on Greek or Etruscan right. myths. One interesting fact, I have a tattoo that says Adontis Fortuna Juvat, which basically means fortune favors the bold, which is a line... From the Enid by Virgil, which is where we got a lot of the myths from the Romans. Ah. Like I said, the Roman myths were often uh, used for historical accounts and taken as kind of biblical truth. Yeah. My favorite fact about Roman mythology is that there were a lot of prophecies about world history and Rome's destiny, and they just happened to to turn up fortuitously at certain times in history, suddenly discovered in these books that nobody but priests could read. So that's Roman mythology. Let's talk about the Trojan horse. All right. So the Trojan horse is part of a tale from the Trojan War. Basically, the Greeks used it to trick the Trojans into letting them in to the city of Troy. The Trojan War had been going on for 10 years, a siege for 10 years. That's crazy. And so the Greeks built this giant wooden horse, and they hid elite warriors inside. The Greeks pretend to sail away. They just leave the horse behind. So the Trojans pull it inside, thinking it's a victory trophy. The soldiers inside wait till nighttime, and then they creep out of the horse and open the gates for the Greek army, who had sailed back under the cover of night. It just seems like... You've been fighting for 10 years, and they just give up, and you're not suspicious? Mm -hmm. That's 10 years. So the Greeks won the war because of this, because they destroyed the city of Troy. The main source of this story is from the Aeneid by Virgil, which is an epic poem in Latin. It's also referred to in Homer's Odyssey. So here's some cool stuff about it. There was an inscription engraved on the horse that said, for their return home, the Greeks dedicate this offering to Athena. And that's kind of how they convinced the Trojans, is that they left it behind as an apology to Athena for destroying so much stuff during the war. There were somewhere between 23 and 40 men inside of the horse. So one guy actually stayed outside of the horse. He was supposed to pretend the Greeks abandoned him. His name was uh, Sinon. And then he was going to signal the Greeks by lighting a beacon at night. I mean, it's a good plan if you can get the other people to go for it. Mm-hmm. An interesting fact about the Trojan horse. Historians think that it may have actually been other things, not actually a horse, just because of wording in ancient Greek. Ah. But there is a very speculative theory by Fritz Schockermeyer. There are a lot of CHs in that word. <laughs> and he says that the Trojan horse was just a metaphor for an earthquake that damaged the walls of Troy and let the Greeks in. Here's his reasoning. 
Horse represents Poseidon, who is the god of the sea, and horses and earthquakes. There are archaeological digs that have found that Troy was heavily damaged in an earthquake, but we don't know when exactly. Yeah, but you can't create an earthquake. Well, supposedly Poseidon could. But also, Poseidon built the walls of Troy in the first place, so... But gods are fickle, so who knows? Also not real. (laughs) So... (laughs) Tomato, tomato. (laughs) So next week, we are going to find out who didn't fall for the trick. Oh. Was it Helen? We will see. Listeners, you have to tune in next week to find out if it was Helen of Troy. So we've made it through all six degrees. We went from May West to vaudeville to acrobats to balance agility to martial arts to Roman mythology to Trojan horse. Next week... We will start with Trojan Horse again. Rosanna, what did you think of this spiral? This was a fun spiral. I had a good time following along. Good. Or or not following along very well at all. (laughs) (laughs) And my favorite part, of course, is all the information about Mae West, because I didn't know any of it. And (gasps) she's amazing. Yeah, she is my new idol. It's time for Cheek of the Week. Because we think Mae West is so incredibly amazing, we are going to do her top five quotes. Ooh. So these are from both movies and just in interviews and life. All right. Number five. When you got the personality, you don't need the nudity. <laughs> <laughs> number four. Marriage is a fine institution, but I'm not ready for an institution. <laughs> Number three, she's the kind of girl who climbed the ladder of success wrong by wrong. (laughs) Like instead of wrong. I I get it. (laughs) (laughs) Number two, between two evils, I generally like to pick the one I've never tried before. (laughs) And number one, my very favorite. When I'm good, I'm very good. When I'm bad, I'm better. (laughs) Oh, that's a good one. (laughs) So we hope that you like Mae West as much as we like Mae West. And you should definitely go read the whole article about her because she was amazing. And let us know if you do. That's our episode. Tune in next time for another Six Degrees of Wiki. You can keep up with us on Twitter at some cheek, Facebook.com slash some cheek, and Instagram at something cheeky podcast. If you have questions, feedback, or an idea for our next wiki spiral, send an email to contact at something cheeky podcast.com. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider making a donation to help us cover our production costs. Just click the donate button on our website. Leaving your review for us on iTunes also really helps. Can't wait for our next show? Check out an episode of Something Cheeky Movies. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.